Well, um, again, this is session four. And uh, as you know, we've had three sessions before this. And if you hadn't had a chance to see the previous sessions, it's online on the, the church webpage. Uh, it's, it is kind of important that you watch each uh, session because we build on top of each session. We're kind of building a, a uh, foundation here, a building starting with the uh, foundation and raising the walls and the, and the ceiling. So it is important. Did everybody survive the last one with the temperaments? Did you find that helpful? Yes. Did you get a chance to read all the uh, explanations of, uh, you know, <laughs> your, your part one thing and something else and how that all works and how helpful that is in your marriage, not only with yourselves, but with your children and even at people at work. It, help, it uh, really helps you to get along better because you can understand that people do have temperaments and, uh, and it's really helpful to understand uh, that. And uh, hopefully everybody understood uh, or, or got over Mr. X too from last week. Uh, somebody came up to me afterwards, uh, the interview with Mr., the obnoxious Mr. X. Somebody came up, up to me afterwards and said, I didn't know you were such a good actor. <laughs> I didn't want to say anything about that, but it really, I wasn't acting. <laughs> what you saw in Mr. X's interview was really the way I was for 30 years. For 30 years, I was a Mr. X. And he did chew his gum that way sometimes. <laughs> I did. So, and he does wear the baseball cap backwards. <laughs> I was so comfortable giving that Mr. X interview, of being Mr. X, it just felt like a comfortable shoe. You know? <laughs> Mr. X is still here. He's alive and well inside of me. Uh, he gets up with me every morning and wants to run the show. And I have to say that Mr. X, my flesh, is not converted. Uh, he, he's not even close to being converted, doesn't even want to be converted. And so every single day I get out of bed, I have to tell Mr. X to sit down and shut up <laughs> because he wants to run the show. So it's, uh, it's something that we, as men, have in us. It's our flesh, and, and it's a constant battle, just like Paul said. You know, the things I want to do, I, I don't do, and the things I don't want to do, I do. Uh, how miserable I am, and that's kind of way the flesh is. It's something that never gets converted. So we have a lot of things to cover today, some very important things, a couple of very important things. Uh, subjects, and, but my wife uh, wants to share a little story with you that will kind of introduce uh, where we're going to go today. Have you ever seen on the news where they show you a, a street and it's got beautiful lawns and there's cars parked all along the side of the road and oak trees and nice houses or that type of a thing? And I, somebody recommended that I watch a YouTube video. And I started watching this YouTube video. And here it was the same scenes, these beautiful uh, streets with cars and trees and houses. And all of a sudden, you could see the street open up with a sinkhole. And cars are falling in it. So it was like they did, had running YouTube videos of all these sink, sinkholes happening all over the United States, in Florida, California, out in the desert, and places like that. And it's just like this, the earth opens up, and what's ever in the way goes plummeting in there. And it actually frightened me after I watched the whole thing. I thought, oh my gosh, the ground I'm standing on, I'm not sure if my house is going to go into a sink sinkhole. But what was interesting in every one of those YouTube videos with the people standing around, you know, gaping at this cavernous hole that just seemed to come out of nowhere, everyone said, well, it, it just happened. I mean, it just happened out of nowhere. We, it, it, it was this perfectly wonderful neighborhood or this perfectly wonderful street, and then it just happened. And the fact of the matter is, it didn't just happen. And that's what people, uh, you know, that the scientists were saying, it didn't just happen. Something was eroding from underneath. The ground was eroding. That 
either the aquifer had dried up and now the ground was you know, sinking into itself or there was too much water and it was eroding the ground. The one that really got me was the sinkhole that had formed in a lake and it reminded me of the tub when you emptied the tub and all the water is going out and I thought, whoa, I wouldn't want to be in a boat on that. But what I got out of it was that it was the same comment. I don't know how this could have happened. It just, it was so perfectly wonderful and then it just happened. And I thought that was a good description of marriage and marriage problems that you think you can go along and it's perfectly all fine and you're handling things, you think you're handling things or especially to people that you go to church with or you go to work with that they would look at you in a church setting or in a, a, a social setting and they'd think, oh, they were just the most perfect couple and they have it all together and they have money and they have houses and they have looks and they have education and they have all of this and it just happened. All of a sudden, they're divorced. I don't know how that could have happened. And so that's my intro into what Wayne wants to read to you because that's what we're trying to to do and what we saw in our own life and I didn't want to admit when I was in class and they introduced this subject I thought no that's not applicable to me I was in like complete denial here I'd been praying and praying and praying that God would rescue me from the pit of doom where I was at where I felt I was at and that here he was bringing me an answer and I was rejecting it because it was like oh no that's not me but we would have gone another few years, we would have been that couple where people would have said, I just don't know how that could have happened. They had it all together. They looked wonderful on the outside, but they didn't really know us because they didn't know what was eroding underneath. And Satan is the master demolition party. He is the one that comes in and he erodes. He digs away and digs away. So if you've ever watched anything about sinkholes, and if you haven't, go look at it, because it's really, really interesting to see how it's this perfectly normal street, but something's been eroding away, taking away, taking away, eating at that dirt that holds up that cement, and it sucked everything in. Everything within its parameter went into that sinkhole. And that, that's how marriage can be. We can be a sinkhole and not even, or going to be a sinkhole and not even know that it's being eroded a little bit at a time. Yeah, that's a great analogy because that's kind of what happened in our life. We thought everything was going along perfectly and underneath was horrible, uh, a horrible setup for a great fall because mm -hmm. we weren't aware of what was going on underneath the surface. So, as you know, we, uh, we attended a Ken Nair seminar called Life, Life uh, Partners, uh, uh, Christ Quest is what the name of it is. And uh, he has really good information. If you get a chance to go online, uh, go to lifepartners.org, and he has several books that you can purchase. And there's videos, there's actually a lot of the seminar material that my wife and I spent three years learning. So it's great, great information if you have a chance to go there. That's again, it's called lifepartners.org. Uh, part of the information that we learned that actually changed my life and got me started on my direction of, of our marriage. It was a real eye-opener to me. The uh, first little book that I bought from them was called Looking Good on the Outside. Looking Good on the Outside, because we were definitely looking good on the outside, but not so good on the inside. And so I want to go over this booklet here with you and go over some information that, that for me was, was life-changing because it, it, it brought to my attention the real condition of our marriage. Because as a man, I didn't have any idea that our marriage was in the condition that it was. And I had to read something or get some instruction to find out just how bad it really was. So I'm going to go through this. And this may be a little disturbing to some when, you, and when we get a little <coughs> bit further in here because there's some very probing questions that we have to all look at as being married. But it's worth going through because it'll help you to see where you're at, the condition of your marriage is today. And what, if you do that, you'll have an opportunity to maybe change it, 
to put some work into it to move it to a better place. So you don't become a sinkhole. So you don't allow Satan to keep digging away and digging away. Because he's real subtle. He's real clever how he does it. And just little by little, little by little, he doesn't come in with a big giant tractor all at once, just taking it out shovel full at a time. It says the primary purpose of this booklet is to shine a light on an obscure subject that involves far too many unsuspecting marriage relationships. I'm calling this subject emotional divorce. Emotional divorce. If needed, hopefully it will provide a guideline that will assist in a personal examination, allowing a husband or a wife to determine if the grievous disease of emotional divorce has infected his or her marriage relationship. Identifying a problem is the first step towards a solution. With that in mind, perhaps this booklet will provide significant insight and understanding, therefore providing a step nearer to a solution. So we're going to be talking about emotional divorce. It's something that people never even consider. Well, I also want to say that maybe you're wondering, well, when are they ever going to get to the part where I take her on a date and give her flowers, that type of thing. But this is about open heart surgery. This isn't about a cutesy little Band-Aid type of situation. You have to realize who you are. And we're, we're laying layers. This is foundational layers of information to get to where we need to go over here. We had done this in an eight-hour seminar, so we could give it all at once. And we're having to stretch it out here and give it a little here and a little there. Uh, one way is easier and the other way, maybe we can give more information this way. So. Be patient with us until <laughs> we get there. Emotional distancing signals the start of emotional divorce. Clark and Connie know that the spark their marriage <coughs> once had is dimming. Little habits and certain characteristics that weren't even noticed when they were first married, which was not so long ago, are becoming more and more irritating. They also find themselves bickering more and more. Wayne and Claudia have been married for a number of years. Everyone thinks they are the perfect couple, but they demonstrate entirely different attitudes towards each other in public than in private. That was true. Ron and Rochelle seem to be an enthusiastic middle-aged couple. Both are busy in the community and very dedicated to the separate causes each has chosen to champion. They are friendly and pleasant to their completely separate set of friends she always with the girls, and he always with the guys. However, if you were able to know them like family, you would notice their attitudes toward one another are indifferent and unloving. Perhaps you're thinking you don't identify with the people above because of their names or personalities or the number of years married. But take a closer look at the attitudes of their hearts toward each other. That's the real purpose of these stories. Their attitudes deep within their heart is what illustrates they are plagued with emotional divorce. Because these couples are outwardly so mild-mannered, the outsider is not likely to suspect that they are candidates for emotional divorce. They themselves don't even suspect it. It's like the, like the sinkhole. If these couples were more vocal and the evidence of their fighting was more open, it would be easier for anyone to recognize that their marriages were in trouble. But then again, it's not unusual to discover that even those couples who do fight more openly don't often think that they are in all that much trouble. Well, that's the way we were. I thought, hey, we're good. She, she's unhappy about a lot of things, but I'm good. Well, she'd always say that it's good to air your grievances. <laughs> but we had a lot of grievances, so it was a lot of airing. The unchallenged enemy emotional divorce. It has never occurred to most people to ask themselves if their marriage is suffering from emotional divorce. Mostly we think there is only one kind of divorce, legal divorce. That's why it's easy for a person to think if I stay together in this marriage and do not go through the legal system, I'm not guilty of divorce. That thinking makes it easier for emotional divorce to exist within and be very dangerous to a marriage relationship. Emotional divorce is, is detected through negative attitudes. Boy, we had a lot of those. 
even unexpressed secret attitudes towards, towards one's spouse exist, existing deep down in their thoughts. Those attitudes develop ever so slowly over a period of years, and they exist as unchallenged enemies, eventually destroying marriages, families, and homes. Just like the sinkhole she was describing. If unrecognized and unchallenged, what person would think to ask themselves the question, is emotional divorce ungodly? Nevertheless, every secret thought or attitude deep within the heart of a person that is not a godly thought, even if it remains only an unfamiliar or secret thought, it is just as offensive to God as if it were acted out. He sees what goes on in our hearts. Being familiar with godliness is not normal to human beings. The Apostle Paul states he would not even have known what sin was, nor would he have known he was a sinner were it not shown to him by God's laws. You can read about that in Romans 7, verse 7 through 20. Until shown differently, most people will not experience much conviction over mere thoughts. That's why Jesus revealed that thoughts or attitudes within a person's heart are just as significant to God as a person's physical actions. Jesus' own words are proof that our innermost secret thoughts, our attitudes, are of great significance. Christ said, You have heard that it was said by them of old time, Thou shalt not commit adultery. But I say unto you that whosoever looks on a woman to lust after her has committed adultery with her already in her heart. Being dissatisfied, disillusioned, and defeated in a marriage equals divorce. Same in God's eyes, whether it's going on in your mind or whether you actually do it physically. God sees it the same. It is the inner person, the human spirit, who experiences dissatisfaction. Disillusionment, uh, disillusionment and becomes defeated. In relationships, when the human spirit experiences the negative emotions, it will seek relief. If a person does not understand his or her own spirit, or the spirit of another. They will not yet truly recognize the full extent of their dilemma. They will not know to examine their situation as a problem within their own spirit. When a person does not understand that their relationship struggles are a matter involving their spirit, their natural tendency will be to use their physical frame or reference to mentally solve their problems. And that's the way I was as a man. I didn't understand that the problem my wife was having was in her spirit. And so I was trying to fix it with physical things. Buying more things for her, bigger house, bigger car. Couldn't understand why she was not getting better. She was not feeling better. Looking for spiritual solutions based on a physical frame of reference will not do much more than consume hundreds of hours. Looking for answers to spirit on a spiritual level problems at the physical mental level will only guarantee one thing, more frustration. And boy, that was our, our problem. We were so frustrated with each other. It seemed like no matter what I did, it wasn't working. Using hum, human reasoning as a primary source for finding spiritual solutions will always result ultimately in greater frustrations dissatisfaction, defeat, and disillusionment in the spirit. And you see that even in the world. These guys who people who are successful in sports or in the music industry or whatever, it seems like they have it all. And they end up committing suicide. What was going on? They were, they were grieved in their spirit, inside their inner man. It was so miserable in that no more things, no more physical things could cure them or help them with what was going on internally in their spirit. As this kind of emotional stress is in relationship escalates, a person will feel an ever-increasing need to eliminate their emotional pain. It becomes a matter of survival. The general pattern is, if I distance myself from my spouse, he or she will not be able to hurt me anymore. And you see that going on all the time. If I just distance myself from her, I won't have to feel it. She will distance herself from me because she will not be able to, to get satisfied by that. Trying to survive without divorce. 
There is a wide variety of reasons why people don't like that they can get a legal divorce while trying to emotionally distance themselves. Some reason may even be noble. A person may be concerned about the emotional or financial effects of divorce upon their children. Some don't want their relatives to think they are failures. There's lots of reasons why people don't go through a divorce. Perhaps they don't want to risk their financial position or status in life. Or divorce may be prohibited by their religious convictions. Then too, there are people who are so emotionally distressed that they cannot make any decision. <laughs> so we were certainly there. So they do nothing. And then there are those who believe it's just their light and lot in life to suffer. And there's, we got a lot of people in the world that do that. Emotional divorce is a common product of an unsatisfactory relationship. It takes place deep in a person within their human spirit. And this is so important that we understand that. Divorce doesn't, people don't just wake up one day and decide to get a divorce. It's something that takes time, it works away at them, and it, it eats away a little bit at a time. It's that sinkhole. Just keep thinking about the sinkhole, what it looks like, and the, what the people said. It just happened all of a sudden. It just appeared, and, and it doesn't. Because divorce starts in the spirit, inside the inner man. Although a person may feel like they have satisfied God because they did not go through the process of getting a legal divorce, they only think that because they do not realize that God looks upon the heart. 1 Samuel 16 shows that. God's displeasure about divorce is based on attitudes that are within the heart. And this has been really important because this hit me real hard when I read this. God does not qualify or disqualify divorce merely because paperwork has or has not been accomplished in a courtroom. We think as long as we don't get a divorce, we're okay with God. When he looks at our heart, he saw that we were emotionally divorced for 30 years. He was not happy with our relationship. And so it, was, it had to be an awakening on my part to see, and it wasn't only until I read this that I realized that I can't fool, I can fool you, but I can't, feel, I can't fool God. And I can't fool my wife. She knows what's going on in our relationship because she feels it more than I do. If the truth were known, if it is true that attitudes of the heart are the key to whether or not a person is divorced, then maybe this booklet has been given you new grounds for reevaluating re-evalu- the condition of your marriage. And that certainly did for me. It was a real eye-opener. The following checklist can be helpful because it reveals a characteristic of emotional divorce. Now I'm gonna, we're gonna send out um, this checklist now this may be a little disturbing because you may not have seen this before, but it's, a, it's an eye opener. We're going to first talk about. Do you want one? The warning signs or symptoms of emotional divorce. This is the warning sign. And as you go, as we go through this, I want you to be honest because it's not going to do you any good here to cheat. So this is between actually you guys. I'd like the husbands and the wives to fill it out on their own sheet because okay. the wives and the husbands think differently about it. And it's important that you see that the difference is in far. So let's go through these one by one, and I'd like you to put a little check after each one of these if it applies. And like I said, it's really, really important that you be honest with these answers. This is for Jim. First of all, is it easier to talk at length with almost anyone other than your spouse? The next one holds grudges against the spouse. Do you hold grudges against your spouse? Personal activities seem to have gradually excluded the spouse. Well, that was true with us. I had my hobbies and I was quite happy doing it all by myself. I was excluding her. He used to ride motorcycles with his friends and he used to fly ultralights. And I was at home with the kids and that was my lot in life. And he didn't seem to 
care that he had these activities that took him away and he wouldn't listen that this was disruptive to the family. It was hard on the children. You know, and it really didn't even bother me because I felt that I was, um, what's the word? Entitled. I'm entitled. I was entitled. I'm the man. I can do this. She can stay home with the kids. Yeah. You know, I, Mr. X mentality again, keep her in her place, barefoot and pregnant while I go out and play. And that's kind of how it was. Frequent negative thoughts towards the spouse. Frequent negative thoughts about the spouse. Holds on to resentments, which are remembered during arguments. I used to talk about, uh, there's a joke about this, these two guys were uh, talking together and this one man said, you know, my, when, when me and my wife fight, she gets historical. <laughs> and the other guy says, what do you mean historical? Don't you mean hysterical? He says, no, historical. Because she remembers everything I ever did for the last 30 years. <laughs> <laughs> okay, next one has friendlier feelings towards other than the spouse. Impatient is a big one. As the queen of that. Yeah, I was impatient too, especially <laughs> when you questioned me on anything that I was doing right. that I felt entitled to. <laughs> Next one, draws children to self for emotional companionship. This is one of the biggest signs you see in a, in a wife or a mother, is that when she starts having that emotional separation from her husband, she'll try to fill that gap with her children. And you'll see a lot of closeness going on and a lot of activity going on just between the, the mother and the children to try to fill that gap that the husband is not filling for her. The next one, attracted to pornography for men or romance, romance novels for women. The next one, addicted to TV sports or I would put in there also video, video games or soaps to the, to the neglect of relationship duties. Well, we see a lot of that in, especially with the men, you know, we're very good at flipping on the TV and watching our sports or playing video games or whatever and not even considering spending any time with our wife. The next one, not paying attention when the spouse speaks. You know, just tuning her out. Or she just tuning me out because she's tired of hearing my story and I'm tired of hearing her story. Those are symptoms of emotional divorce. Frequent arguments or fights. Next one, busy religious schedule doesn't leave enough time for a spouse. I mean, that happens a lot in the Christian community. Then when people are starting to separate, they spend a lot of time at church with activities and whatever, feeling that, hey, that we're, we're okay with God. Yeah, we don't have a, a lot of time to spend with each other, but hey, I'm working for God. No, that's a, that's a cover up for what's really going on. Next one, gives marriage advice knowing it is not being personally applied. Hypocrisy, oh boy, that was big for me. This was the one that really would get me because I would go out and get all the books and I'd find all the information. And one particular book I remember finding, I, I can still see myself in the swimming pool with this book that I had bought and I was so excited he'd come home from work and I'm telling him about everything I read in this book and because I thought he would read it and make application between us. Instead, he takes it and he reads it and he gives a, a sermonette at church and he had not applied any of it, not applied any of it. And I remember sitting there seething over this because Oh yeah, everyone thought, oh, he's so wonderful. I mean, he knows all this stuff and I'm sitting there knowing full well he had not applied not one minute of that book in our relationship. You know, that could be a real reason why in most Christian churches you only get one or two marriage sermons a year because <laughs> the, the pastor up here giving marriage advice, looking at his wife sitting there glaring at him. <laughs> And so they, they, think they just kind of pass it up. It's like, I don't want to go there, open that door. And also, you know, I have to, this kind of really brings back Mr. X again, because, you know, I was giving advice knowing it wasn't personally being applied. You know, I, I showed up at Mr. X at church all the time. I, maybe I didn't have my hat on backwards and my glasses on or chewing gum. <laughs> but God 
saw Mr. X show up at church, and so did my wife. And here I was being the hypocrite, going to help everybody else and not applying it, anything into our own relationship. Next one, becoming depressed at the thought of going home. You know, my wife used to, uh, yeah, you said you used to get almost sick to your stomach mm -hmm. when I'd come home from work. Yeah, I oh, did. Geez. I wanted him to come home. I was looking forward to coming home, but when the car drove up, I, would, I could feel that gripping anxiety in my stomach because I always felt that I was never good enough and right enough, um, and I didn't feel loved and cared for. I, I had things, lots of things, but not a feeling of being cared for and love, love for who I was because I felt uh, that he was critical of who I was. And so here he was coming home, and here we go again. You know, it was going to start all over again. Yeah, well, <laughs> if you discover that you can identify with at least five of the symptoms on this list, you can count them up. If you have at least five, you'll want to try the next list, and Claudia's going to take care of that one. This is emotionally divorced in fact. I mean, it's like when it really happens to you. Separate lifestyle and activities. Habitually going to bed at different times for reasons other than health or job. Discontinued sex life. Virtually no conversation with spouse. Rage or silence depending on individual temperament. And I was one who would either rage or go silent so that I could get heard. I felt I wasn't being heard, so I would take those approaches. Mostly condemning of spouse's character through negative reports. And we did it to each other. Uh, an unusually close friend or confident of the, confidant of the opposite sex. Plotting vengeance. I did that a lot. Separate friendships. Finds married life depressing contemplates legal divorce, feelings of hopelessness, and I felt hopeless a lot, constantly patronizing spouse, anything to avoid conflicts but holding bitterness. Now, when I got this booklet in class and I read through these things, I had come to this class in, in hopes of God answering my prayers that I had prayed for so many years, and yet I'm reading this stuff and I was in such denial, I couldn't admit that I, I, didn't, I didn't want the reality of it to be this, and so I couldn't admit that it was this, because it was horrifying to me that I had hung on so long waiting for God to answer my prayers, and, and this is where we had come to. All the Sabbath keeping, holy day keeping, paying your tithes and not eating pork had not solve this problem. I had done all these physical, religious things and, and feeling like if I had done that, surely that would solve this relationship problem. And so I did not, I looked at both lists here and I didn't want to admit I had any of them because in admitting I had any of these things, it said that I was a failure and that I was wrong and I wasn't right and I wasn't good enough. And so now that's even playing into worse about how I felt about myself because I couldn't make it work. I couldn't, all the books I read was, had not solved anything. It had solved it for two weeks or something or a month or whatever, but it, like this number 13 on the bottom here, constantly patronizing spouse, anything to avoid conflicts but holding bitterness, and that's where I'd finally come because just to keep him happy so that, so that I would get that feeling of being loved. I would do anything to get that feeling of being loved. And I had to get real with myself in order to heal. It's kind of like uh, being sick and then, but you don't, I don't want to do anything that the doctor's telling me because I'm not going to admit I actually have this sickness. So I'm going to try to pretend I don't have this sickness and then ignore the doctor. Well, we don't do that. We listen to what the doctor says. We take the medicine he says to take. We admit we've got the problem and you know, off we go and we can begin to heal. But I had to, I had to admit we were definitely in here. And I'd come from a broken home and so in my mind, divorce was simply not going to happen in, in my lifetime. But I didn't realize that being emotionally divorced was just as bad as being, doing the deed and getting the paperwork done. 
So. All right. If you discover that your marriage is a victim of emotional divorce, you are not alone. Okay. If an interview with every Christian couple were possible, and each person had no choice but to reveal the secret attitudes in their hearts, don't be surprised if you discover the following type of statistics. Among women, at least 75% are already experiencing the struggles of emotional divorce. 75%. Among men, at least 25% are, are already experiencing emotional divorce. The reason for the striking statistical difference between men and women is that women are usually more emotionally functional in life than men are. So true. They, the women, they sense a negative emotional atmosphere in a marriage sooner than do most men and are more quickly engulfed by those negative emotions that are most men. I don't think we have time to read that whole book that way. Yeah, well, I just we, wanted we to cover this one little piece here and then okay. we're done. Okay. I know we're conscious of the time here. <laughs> so. Let the following typical scenarios serve as supporting evidence. It is very common for husbands to be passive about pursuing marriage problems. Boy, that was for sure. I was very passive about it. She had to threaten me to be, uh, expose me to the ministry about the condition of our marriage before I agreed to go to a marriage sar seminar. That shows you. And I was reading every <laughs> book that anyone ever printed out <laughs> yeah. there, trying to resolve it. Waiting until their wives are ready to leave. See, most men don't realize that they have a marriage problem until the, w the women are ready to leave. And then it's when they were ready to leave, then they think, okay, things are serious enough. I guess I better do something about it. They see something physical happening. It's not, they don't pick up any of the, the attitudes or the, the hurt of the wife. It's a physical thing they're looking for. And everything looked good, and that's the way it was with our wife. Life. I thought everything was good because she was still in the house. The clothes were still in the closet. <laughs> Kids were still playing. You know, she was cooking me dinners. I didn't realize there was an issue. I didn't realize I was seething yeah. inside, seething inside, which is the perfect, the perfect scenario for Satan to get in there. It's perfect landscape for him to take the shovel and to be, begin digging away. Those husbands typically in shock say, my wife is leaving me. When asked why, the typical husband responds, I don't know, she won't tell me. <laughs> and he's not being deceitful. He really isn't. He doesn't have a clue what's going on because they're so emotionally dysfunctional. So what's to be done? Divorce cannot be an option. And this is so important that we realize that. Divorce cannot be an option, and this is why. A person seeking divorce is not looking for a solution. Divorce is a conclusion. A person mm -hmm. seeking divorce is not looking for a solution. Divorce is a conclusion. When seeking a solution, an individual is working for continuation, seeking to bring life back into the marriage. A conclusion, on the other hand, signals an end to the marriage. But human nature usually goes for the easy solution, don't we? We want the easy way out. And for too, too many people, get married embracing an easy solution of divorce as a future option. And that is so true. Hey, if it don't work out, we'll just get divorced. We'll get the next one. Mr. X, you know, hey, I'm not dealing with her. I'm going to go. The girl at work there, she's giving me the eye, you know? But the problem with that is you take yourself into the next relationship. It, it, until you resolve your own issues, you're taking yourself into a new relationship and it just replicates itself. That's why uh, second marriages are, they have the, one of the highest divorce rates, 70% fail second times around, so. And for too many people, getting married, embracing an easy solution of divorce as a future option, such a mindset does not demand that a person find solutions. Once divorce is accepted as an option, what is there to compel or force a person to search for a solution? Yeah, no, I'm just gonna get rid of her. However, if there is no possibility of divorce, if no alternative, then a person will refuse to give up until solutions are found. 
Even for Christians, that kind of determination is possible only when a person's relationship with God is serious enough that disobedience causes them great discomfort. They will not change their doctrine about divorce even when circumstance seems impossible. It's worth repeating, divorce cannot be an option. There are answers. And that's why we're here. There are answers. We can, we can pass on information that will transform your marriage, transform your family relationships altogether. And that's what happened with us. But I didn't know there was a way out until I read this book. I had no idea that our, our marriage was in the condition that it was in. Well, I kept telling him. I kept but saying to him. you're a woman. What do you know? This is really in bad condition. This is in really bad shape here. <laughs> But he wouldn't listen to me. I didn't get listened to. And he had 101 excuses. And it usually fell on, you're too bossy, you're impatient, you're this, you're that, and the whatever. And so then I spent a lifetime trying to fix myself, trying to become what I thought he wanted me to be so I can please him. And then everything would be wonderful. But no matter what I did, he stayed the same. Yeah. And so it didn't solve the problem. Yeah. When I first read this book, it was the first time I really heard and understand that as human beings, we have a human spirit. That's what separates us from the animal world. She has a human spirit in her, I have a human spirit in me. This is what God is looking for in us. This is what God is going to resurrect. He's not going to resurrect the, the body, the flesh. He's resurrecting the human spirit. It's the human spirit that needs to be cared for and to be nourished. And as a husband, I didn't even know she had a human spirit. Didn't have a clue. And to kind of show you the analogy of that, I've got a little, a little, uh, uh, what do you call this? Baggy. Baggy. Here is a plastic baggy, okay? And what is it worth? Half a penny, two pennies maybe. It's very flimsy, has no physical strength to it, you lay it out in the sun, and in two or three days it deteriorates, it just collapses. Well, this is what our human body is. This is how God looks at our human body. You know, it, this is our tent. And this is when I looked at what my wife, this is what I saw. Just a baggie. You know, there, it was just her, this is her, yeah, this is her baggie. But there was something inside of her that I didn't even know that God had given, and that is the human spirit. That's, what got, that's the important or the valuable part of, of what we are composed of. I want to show you this little bill right here. What did you say that is? Well, it says it's a hundred. A hundred, is it real? <laughs> yes. It's a real hundred dollar bill. I'm gonna put this inside of this bag. Because this is what God sees when he looks at individuals. It's not the baggie he sees, it's, it's the, what's valuable that's inside the package. The human spirit. This is what God is after, this is what God wants the husband to take care of in his wife, is her human spirit. He spent all those years yeah. putting clothes on the plastic bag, putting shoes on the plastic, plastic bag, yeah. uh, putting a roof over the head of the plastic bag, giving the plastic bag cars and boats and trips yeah. and I was dying inside even though I had everything to take care of the baggie. What does a man see when he sees a pretty girl walking down the street? Does he see the hundred dollar bill that's inside? No. no, he's looking at her baggie. Saying, wow, <laughs> look at that baggie. <laughs> really? That's true. When I first saw her the first time I saw her, I was checking her baggie out. I, <laughs> I had no idea about a human spirit, the valuable thing in her life. And so when I learned that, it was such an amazing thing for, for me to see that I got to stop looking at the baggie and start dealing with her human spirit. That's why a, a lady says when a, when a husband is not listening to her, and she says to her, to her I want you to know me, know me, know me, listen to me. What is she saying? She, she's, she's asking you to see her human spirit. That's what's valuable to her. And that's the thing that we husbands have to learn 
to take care of is her human spirit. And there's ways to do that. But I didn't have a clue that she even had a spirit to start with. But now that I do, and through the training that I've, that I've learned over the years, and, now, and applying what I have learned, I'm now able to care for her spirit. So it, when we talked about in our classes, we went through the human spirit for like <laughs> six weeks. And I'm trying to explain this to you in 20 minutes. And that, that's a huge subject. I can't even begin to go into the, the vastness and the importance of the human spirit that's in man and how important it is in relationship between a husband and wife. So there's lots of scriptures to prove it. But yeah, I, I first had to be proved to that there was a human spirit. You know, I, I, I kind of heard it or I read it a little bit here and there or didn't understand, nobody ever really explained it to me. And so let me take you through a few scriptures just to, to verify and validify that there is a human spirit in all of us. And I don't care if you live in Manhattan or if you, uh, are, you live in Tahiti in the jungle with a grass skirt. If you're <laughs> human, you have a human spirit. It's, uh, God has placed it into your life. Let's turn to Romans 8, verse 16, if you have a Bible with you. We're just going to go through some scriptures kind of quickly here, just so you can see it. It's actually scriptural. Romans 8, verse 16. Verse 16, the Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. See, that's what makes us God's children. That's why every human being on earth has a human spirit, and that's what makes us children of God. They're all going to be someday have the opportunity to be in part of God's family because of the human spirit that's in them. Uh, let's go to uh, Proverbs 8.14. I know we're going to have to really hurry here because things, it's so hard to get to squeeze this stuff in. When I was going over this this morning, I thought it was, it's almost hopeless to try to give you guys enough information and a little bit of time that we have. But Proverbs 18, verse 14. The human spirit can endure in sickness, but a crushed spirit, who can bear? My wife had a crushed spirit for 30 years because I didn't even know she had one didn't even know how to care for it. I don't have any time to go through any more of these, but if, you, if you've got something to write down, let me just give you these. Proverbs 32, verse 18. James 2, verse 26. Acts 7, verse 59. 1 Corinthians 5, verse 5. 1 Corinthians 2, verse 11. Those scriptures all talk about the human spirit. So it's, it's real. It's important, and, it, and it's part of God's design. And, and, our, and our, the importance of it is, uh, the importance of a, of, a, of a husband is to understand that his wife has a spirit and that she needs, that spirit needs to be cared for. No? I, I do, you, do we have time? Let's see. It's 44 minutes. We got to cut it off. I'm sorry. But we wanted to go into we'll go into it next time, is, is how do you recognize the, the human spirit? How do you re relate, how can you communicate with the, uh, the human spirit? And how to uh, uh, hear the voice of the human spirit? Because the, the human spirit has a voice, believe it or not. So we have lots of information to cover next week, and we're gonna go deeper into the subject. And I apologize again because of our, uh, the shortness of time, but. It's so important that we understand the purpose of the human spirit and why a husband has to learn to care for his wife's human spirit in order for there to be a relationship. Because if I can't have a spirit-to-spirit -spirit <coughs> relationship with my wife, I can't have a spirit relationship with anybody else. And I can't have a spirit relationship with God. So God has given us a wife who has a human spirit to teach us how to have a spirit-to-spirit -spirit relationship with each other so that we can learn how to have a spirit-to-spirit -spirit relationship with God. Because God says he wants to be worshipped in spirit and in truth. What he wants is a relationship, a spirit-to-spirit -spirit relationship. 
Remember uh, God uh, in the Old Testament, he was so upset with the Israelites because they kept falling short. They were, they were following the physical things that God asked them to do. But they, they weren't getting the spirit-to-spirit -spirit relationship. And God, what did God say to them? If they only had a heart in them. He's looking for a relationship. And so we're going to move ahead the next time. We'll go into this. It's, it's a fascinating subject. And I hope uh, you can all be here to listen next time. And, and we'll try to, be, to fit in as much as we can in the time allotted. So thank you for coming, and we'll uh, see you next week.